It's actually me, uh, Dr. Hirsch, who should be thanking you for the invitation to be here today. This has got to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world and one of the best uh, convention centers as well. So every year from now on, invite me. Uh, there's now a growing desire amongst spacefaring nations to venture beyond Earth to explore the inner solar system. And deep space missions are now being planned by NASA and other spacefaring nations, including Australia. This is exciting stuff. When I say deep space missions, I'm speaking of a return to lunar orbit, and then down to the surface of the moon, then on to an asteroid, and then on to Mars. These will be ambitious, daring voyages. Deep space exploration will expose astronauts to a number of environmental hazards, including ionizing radiation, but also physiological and psychosocial stressors, unlike anything previously experienced. And accordingly, the maintenance of the health, well-being, and the performance of future astronauts is regarded as one of the most significant challenges to be addressed before we're ready to launch the first crew. In the next 35 minutes, I'll discuss the unique challenges of living and working in deep space. I'll describe how we expect to monitor the health and performance of the future astronauts and treat their medical problems. And I'll describe some of the operational approaches and critical technologies, approaches and technologies, I expect, that will be aligned with your task of monitoring and managing the radiation exposure of deep space explorers. For an astronaut, Mars is the ultimate dream. I know that it is for you as well. Not surprisingly, Mars is the theme for this space day of the 2019 ICRP Symposium. A voyage to Mars will help answer some of humanity's fundamental questions. What can the geology of Mars teach us about Earth's past, present, and future? Was Mars ever home to life? What can Mars teach us about the start of life on Earth? And could Mars one day be a safe second home for humans? Well, before we contemplate human missions to Mars, let's review what we already know about the red planet. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun, the second smallest planet in the solar system, about half the diameter of Earth. Gravitational force is about 38%, or about one third of that of Earth's gravity. So if you weigh 80 kilograms here on Earth, then you weigh 30 kilograms on Mars. The Martian year is almost twice as long as an Earth year, the planet takes about 687 years to, days to, make a, to revolve around the sun, and Mars, Mars rotates on an axis that's pointed approximately to the North Star, and this axis is tilted with respect to its orbital plane around the sun, so Mars, like Earth, experiences seasons. And Mars spins slightly slower on its rotational axis than Earth, meaning that a Martian day is a bit longer than an Earth day, about 24 hours and 39 minutes. <clears throat> Mars does have an atmosphere, but it's very thin. The atmospheric pressure on the surface is less than 1% of that on Earth. The atmosphere is made up largely of carbon dioxide with trace amounts of nitrogen, argon, oxygen, and water vapor. And no, this is not Adelaide, this is Mars. <laughs> Surprisingly, the thin atmosphere of Mars does support winds and dust storms. These images are from the Mars Global Surveyor. Uh, in the image on the left, in the bottom right corner of the, the planet, you can see some seed storms that are beginning. Uh, two months later, the storms have dramatically developed into a planet-wide dust storm, obscuring the planetary surface for months in 2001. And the same thing happened again last year. Most of Mars is well below the freezing point of water for most of the year. In the summertime and in the equatorial regions, the daytime temperatures climb above freezing. However, the atmospheric pressure is so low that on warming, water ice turns instantly into water vapor, bypassing the liquid phase. And since it's further from the sun, Mars receives less sunlight than Earth. Without much of an atmosphere, almost all of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun reaches Mars' surface. And as you well know, without a protective magnetosphere, the Martian surface is exposed to much higher levels of ionizing radiation than on Earth. Mars has interesting geography. 
Uh, Mars is red in color because the surface is covered by a layer of iron oxide dust, and the planet is home to one of the largest volcanoes in the solar system. Olympus Mons is three times the elevation of that of Mount Everest. Valles Marineris is a huge canyon running east-west <clears throat> along Mars for 4,000 kilometers, dwarfing Earth's Grand Canyon. And so we see that Mars is a remarkable place to explore, but its harsh environment will make living and working there challenging for future intrepid explorers. A group of 15 international agencies, including the Australian government, has been working for several years to develop a vision to explore deep space on an international collaborative partnership. The group, known as the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, has published a roadmap that lays out a general plan that is like a, a best guess how we're going to explore the inner solar system and how this will be done over the next two decades. The ultimate goal is that astronauts will explore the surface of Mars sometime in the 2030s. Even with a decade to plan and prepare, this time horizon is ambitious since the challenges of executing such a, a mission are daunting. The trajectory to Mars will take place in phases. Phase one of the plan involves building a spaceport around the moon known as the Lunar Gateway. Construction will begin in 2022. The gateway will include workspace, propulsion, life support, and limited medical capabilities. It will eventually support a four-person crew for up to 30 days at a time. The International Space Station partners will be coming together again to build and operate the Lunar Gateway. NASA will provide a power and propulsion element, as well as habitation and utilization modules. The European Space Union Agency will provide a module called the European System Providing Refueling Infrastructure and Telecommunications, also known as ESPRIT. Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, will provide a multi-purpose module to function as a docking node and an airlock. Europe or Japan will provide a second habitation module in Japan or NASA will provide logistics resupply. Canada has committed to providing the robotic systems for the Lunar Gateway. We will build an AI-enabled Canadarm3 that will repair and maintain the gateway, and a similar, smarter, smaller robot that will work inside the station. We'll deliver the first robot in 2026. We hope that other nations who are not part of the ISS partnership will contribute to the gateway and other international exploration missions of the future. The Lunar Gateway will play a key role. It will serve as a research lab, an engineering and medical test bed, and a staging base to support future missions to deeper space. And the Lunar Gateway will function as a transportation hub, supporting astronaut missions to the surface of the moon and elsewhere. And this will be the beginning of a sustained human presence. Earlier this year, President Trump directed NASA to accelerate the plan to return astronauts to the moon. He'd like to see astronauts on the moon by 2024. NASA plans to build an outpost near the moon's south surface. Like the Lunar Gateway, the outpost will also function as a test bed. Phase two, of the Global Exploration Roadmap involves deploying a long-distance human spacecraft known as the Deep Space Transport. The Deep Space Transport will include a habitation module with propulsion capability and advanced life support. It will make repeated journeys from the Lunar Gateway to destinations beyond the Earth-Moon system. And then voyages of the Deep Space Transport will include orbital flybys of Mars and possibly visits to the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos. And once these capabilities have been demonstrated, the international partners will have the confidence and the infrastructure in place to support other deep space missions. So future missions will venture to a variety of locations. However, Mars is the ultimate destination. 
In my opinion, we will see astronauts on Mars in two decades. How will we get there? The design for the Mars landing mission was completed by NASA several years ago. It's known as the Mars Design Reference Architecture. It is not a formal plan, but it provides a vision and identifies some of the needed technologies. So this is how a Mars mission might unfold. Sometime in the 2030s and 26 months prior to the departure of the crew, two cargo vehicles will be assembled in Earth orbit and then launched to Mars. The cargo vehicles will contain critical mission equipment and supplies that must be pre-deployed ahead of the crew arrival. The first cargo vehicle will include the Mars Ascent vehicle. This is the vehicle that will eventually be used by the crew at the end of their stay on Mars to launch from the surface of Mars back to orbit and then the trip home. When this, second, when this cargo vehicle arrives at Mars, it will land on the surface under rocket power. Once on the surface, an automated fuel production plant will be unloaded and robotically deployed and begin operation to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to, pr to produce oxygen. O liquid oxygen will then be stored in the propellant tanks of the ascent vehicle. It will eventually feed the ascent engine that launches the vehicle and the crew back to Mars orbit prior to the return journey back to Earth. Once we know that the power plant and the production of propellant is going well, we'll make plans for the crew departure from Earth. 26 months after the launch of the cargo pre-deployment uh, missions, six crew members will head off to Mars on the trip of a lifetime. Five rocket launches will have been required to assemble the Mars transfer vehicle in low Earth orbit, or perhaps at the Lunar Gateway. The crew uh, will rendezvous with the Mars transport vehicle, which is the large vehicle that will take the crew to Mars and then return them back to Earth at the end of the mission. It will take six months for the crew to get to Mars. When they arrive, they will rendezvous with the service habitat lander, which was the second cargo vehicle that was earlier pre-deployed and was waiting in, in Mars orbit for them. From there, the crew will transfer into the large module and descend to the surface. The surface habitat lander then becomes part of the Mars base. The crew will establish their center of operations at this site. The habitat will house the crew on landing legs above the surface. And later in the day, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the wisdom of placing a habitat above the, Earth surf above the Mars surface. The vehicle will also house the food stores and enough habitation and exploration resources for an 18-month stay. The base will include the crew habitat, which is said will be mounted on, on the lander, a small nuclear reactor, scientific equipment, and at the second uh, pre-deployed site, uh, an ascent vehicle, equipment and supplies, and another small nuclear reactor. The surface habitat lander will also have a pressurized long distance rover. The crew will use this rover for mobility and science. It will have a range of 100 kilometers and will allow the crew to explore in multiple sites at great distances from their base for science. And if they did not land close to the pre-deployed Mars ascent vehicle, the crew will use the rover to drive to it. At the end of the 500 day sojourn, the crew will ascend to Mars high orbit in their Mars ascent vehicle, rendezvous again with the Mars transfer vehicle, perform a trans-Earth insertion, and enjoy a very fulfilling six-month journey back to Earth. So, about 30 months after the crew have launched, the six crew members will parachute in their Orion vehicle back to Earth to end one of the most historic exploratory missions ever. So much of what I've described probably sounds like black magic or wishful thinking. There are admittedly many critical exploration technologies that must first be developed. The first challenge I see is that we currently don't have the capability to land people on Mars. The one ton 
Curiosity rover is the largest object that we have landed on Mars. Human missions will require landing at least 40 tons. Landing Curiosity was like landing a car. For a human mission, we're talking about landing a small two-story house, and then another two-story house with fuel and supplies right next to it. So landing things at that scale will require development of new technologies that have to be repeatedly tested, and thus the utility of the Lunar Gateway as a test bed for developing some of these technologies. Other challenges are operational. The operational profile of deep space missions will be unlike any ever flown before. A flight to the Red Planet, for instance, will be a 400 million kilometer journey. It will include extreme velocities. We'll need a total delta V for that mission of 72,000 kilometers per hour, which is a lot of propulsion for rockets to provide. And these missions will be long, a round trip. Mission to Mars will last two and a half years, and there will be little or no cargo resupply due to the great distance from Earth. Resupply with consumables and spare parts for failed equipment will be limited. And then there will be communication delays as well. Mars, by travel time, is six months from Earth. By speed of light, it's 20 minutes away, a 20-minute voice and data latency between the spacecraft and Earth. So, for example, if I am on, uh, on the ground at Mission Control and I say good morning to you on Mars, it will take between 7 and 20 minutes for you to hear me say good morning. It will take another 7 or 20 minutes for me to hear your response. So communication latencies will greatly reduce the role of Mission Control in assisting the astronauts with problems that they encounter. Other operational features of this new class of missions will include limited crew size, Processed food with long shelf lives instead of fresh fruits and vegetables. Limited volume, mass, and power allowances for onboard equipment and systems. There will also be life support systems that will need to be near closed loop. When I spent my six months aboard the International Space Station, I thought I would be perform performing mostly research, but a good chunk of my time was spent repairing uh, equipment. The oxygen generator failed, the carbon dioxide Scrubber failed, the exercise countermeasure system failed. You're going to laugh when I say this, but the toilet failed as well. And when the toilet's not working, then it's not a fun experience in space. So all spacecraft systems for a Mars mission will need to be reliable and robust and function autonomously with limited monitoring and control by flight controllers on the ground. Furthermore, deep space missions will expose astronauts to psychological stressors, not just isolation and, and confinement, but extreme isolation and confinement, privacy and habitability issues, and heterogeneous crews that represent a variety of nationalities, cultures, ethnicities, races, and, and problem-solving techniques. Relationships with family members and friends will be at a distance and external interactions with the ground support team. So we see a Mars mission will be ambitious and daunting. And it's not just engineers who are re-examining the operational profile of deep space missions. Physicians, life science researchers, biomedical engineers, and human, and human factor specialists are also rethinking operational concepts of healthcare, crew performance, and life support. The concept of medical operations for past flights in low Earth orbit has been what we call Earth-centric. In other words, the overall health of the astronauts aboard the space shuttle and the space station has been managed by a medical team on the ground. Yes, expected and, and routine medical incidents that occurred aboard the space station could be handled by those of us designated as the crew medical officer. But for more complicated or urgent issues that could not be readily resolved, a flight surgeon on the ground has managed the medical situation until the crew member could be stabilized and transported to Earth in a tertiary care center for definitive treatment. And this concept of medical operations has been made possible by abundant real-time data and voice and communication between the ground medical team and the onboard crew. 
This concept has worked well in low Earth orbit, but it will not be practical in the future once astronauts venture deeper into space. For instance, the medical eva evacuation from deep space to Earth of a seriously ill crew member for emergency care will not be an option. Ground-based oversight in urgent situations will not be possible. And the onboard medical facility will need to support complete and autonomous care for health and all medical and surgical eventualities. The limited volume, mass, and power allowances of the Mars vehicle and habitat means that the size of the onboard medical care facility will be limited. It will not be a well-outfitted hospital. Exercise countermeasures will, not, will be smaller than the exercise systems currently aboard the International Space Station. So, the delivery of medical care for deep space astronauts will revert from Earth-reliant to Earth-independent. It will feature different operational concepts, autonomous, patient-centric, point-of-care, and virtual care delivery models. Medical operations will become more autonomous since the voice and data latency will preclude real-time consultation with and intervention by the medical support team on the ground. At least one member of the crew must be a broadly experienced physician. This will be the first step in onboard medical autonomy. This physician astronaut skill set will need to include mental health skills. Being so far from Earth, far enough that home becomes just a tiny point of light in the sky, could be psychologically challenging for the crew. And the onboard health informatics network will feature AI-based decision-making, intelligent onboard systems that will aid the crew with health monitoring, diagnosis, and therapy. For those of you that are my age, the AI entity in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey was named HAL 9000. The responsibilities of HAL included the monitoring of the immense spaceship's complex vehicle systems, but also monitoring the ongoing health of the crew members, some of whom were in deep hibernation. In the distant future, I foresee a developing relationship between astronauts and artificial intelligence systems, like a well-behaved HAL 9000 and R2-D2. Humans are good at repair, mobility, dexterity, speed, judgment, dealing with ambiguities, and on-the-spot decision-making. While automated systems are good at data management, pattern recognition, and system oversight. These same AI-enabled technologies will empower deep space astronauts with their own health information and assist them to play a greater role in the self-management of their own health and well-being. Aboard the International Space Station, astronauts routinely draw tubes of their own blood, as well as urine and saliva, as part of periodic health exams and science research. Onboard analysis of biospecimens does not currently exist. Therefore, astronauts store biospecimens in a freezer on the ISS. The specimens are then returned to Earth for analysis days or weeks later. On deep space missions, laboratory diagnosis will need to be performed on board. It will not be possible to send biospecimens and environmental samples to the ground for analysis. With a view of the future, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David Saint-Jacques tested such an analyzer system during his recent ISS expedition. The bioanalyzer is a portable liquid sample analysis device that's the size of a shoebox. It incorporates a microfluidic device, lab on a chip technology, and a cell analysis subsystem and programs. So using just a few drops of liquid, blood, saliva, or urine, the bioanalyzer performs blood cell counts. And it measures levels of certain proteins and biomarkers. And it provides test results when, within two or three hours. So freezing and stowage of samples is no longer required. Healthcare delivery to deep space astronauts will require the incorporation of new virtual care capabilities. The term virtual healthcare 
refers to uh, digital and communications technologies that facilitate delivery of healthcare to remote locations. So it can involve, for example, the exchange of types of information from transmission of laboratory results to teleconsultations with specialists and e-visits with patients, and also teleradiology, teledermatology, and telepsychiatry. So incorporation of these kinds of virtual care capabilities into deep space missions will facilitate the transmission of medical information as well as consultations between astronauts and the ground-based surgeons. And as we venture further into space, we can be sure that new medical problems will arise. We can't predict and train for every medical eventuality. I therefore envision that uh, AI-guided telemonitoring, telementoring will play a role by helping the crew perform diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. When I flew aboard the space station, a crew member and I uh, experienced some atypical visual problems. We were asked by our flight surgeon to perform ultrasound imaging and fundoscopic uh, examination of our eyes. We never trained for these procedures prior to flight. However, a technician on the ground successfully telemetered us in flight through the procedures and we obtained high quality imagery that aided the flight surgeon on the ground to make a diagnosis. We're starting to consider the medical conditions that we'll see during deep space missions. In addition to enduring the effects of weightlessness on the six month transit to Mars and on the six month trip back, astronauts will be exposed to higher levels of ionizing radiation. Decompression sickness is another problem that could arise during a spacewalk and there are some scenarios where surgical care could be required to treat trauma. Medical situations that have emerged in analogous situations such as Antarctic research stations or nuclear submarines include strokes, appendicitis, bone fractures, cancer, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, psychiatric illness, and kidney stones. The medical facility aboard a deep space vehicle and a habitat will monitor the health of astronauts and provide medical and surgical care capabilities. It will have limited capabilities and facilities, maybe akin to that of a small village medical clinic. It will include medical, surgical, and emergency equipment. It will have the uh, equipment needs uh, to perform a periodic health exam. It will have cardiopulmonary resuscitation equipment and an airlock that could also serve as a hyperbaric chamber. I anticipate that the onboard imaging modality will be solely restricted to ultrasound, X-ray as well if we're lucky, but due to the constraints of power, mass, and volume, it would be impossible, for instance, to include a CT scanner or an MRI. Many physicians dream of a portable wireless device in the palm of our hands that monitors and diagnoses our patients' health conditions. It uh, materialized, although only on TV, as the medical tricorder in Star Trek. When Dr. McCoy grabbed his tricorder and scanned a patient, the portable handheld device immediately listed the vital signs, other parameters, and a diagnosis. Well, science fiction has become science fact. And thanks to the recent $10 million Qualcomm XPRIZE competition, the tricorder has become a reality. The winning teams developed tricorder devices that diagnose 13 health conditions and measure five vital signs. It's remarkable technology that may drive lower healthcare costs, and these systems could help astronauts of the future, as well as chronic care patients living at home to manage their health and well-being. If you're going to Mars, you'll need to take your own consumables, except it isn't just air, water, clothing, and food you've got to worry about. If a spacecraft system malfunctions, you must have the spare parts and tools to repair it. Similarly, if someone gets sick, you need the right medical equipment, but packing for every medical eventuality will not be possible. A large inventory of unneeded supplies would take up valuable stowage volume. So part of the solution is to take 3D printers that can produce supplies on demand. The International Space Station already has one on board, and so a Mars trip could include a 3D printer and raw material. There's also a suggestion that astronauts could bring along raw pharmaceutical 
ingredients instead of a fully formulated medical cabinet. Over the past decades, specialists in space medicine have successfully developed countermeasures to deal with most of the medical problems associated with cardiovascular and musculoskeletal deconditioning. The equipment is used for the daily performance of exercise to mini minimize these effects of space flight. However, exercise devices used in deep space will have to be much smaller than the exercise devices usually currently used aboard the station. I know that you are studying low atomic weight materials that could be uh, integrated into the structure of the Mars spacecraft or shield the crew from continuous and isotropic uh, galactic cosmic radiation. And in the event of a major solar flare, um, the spacecraft must also include a safe haven to shelter the crew from high doses of radiation. The environmental health care system monitors the spacecraft for gaseous and microbial contaminants, also for water quality, acoustics, and radiation levels. Purity of the cabin environment is important to the crew, and during my six-month expedition, I routinely monitor the environmental conditions. I periodically um, measured the, took air samples to assess the quality of the air that we were breathing, and water samples to assess the quality of the water that we were drinking. I sampled these, um, these uh, products and then sent them down to the Earth for analysis. Future astronauts, however, must depend on advanced sensor and analysis systems to autonomously monitor the cabin environment. During my six-month stay aboard the space station, I was routinely monitored uh, for my physiological state, including in this case here, uh, continuous ECG, continuous uh, blood pressure and my activity level there. This works fine, but it's rather cumbersome and bulky. I envision that sensors and AI will play a greater role in monitoring and accumulating physiological data for the crews of the future. Such a network could include real-time integration and analysis of this physiological data. This here is an example of a smart shirt called AstroSkin that is currently aboard the International Space Station. The smart shirt is non-invasive. It's designed to be worn by the crew continuously during their daily routine, including sleep and exercise. Uh, the smart shirt being worn here by David Saint-Jacques includes pulse rate and ECG, blood pressure, respiratory rate and volume, skin temperature, blood oxygen, saturation, and physiological uh, activity level, levels. So these are some of the capabilities that we need to gain from developing deep, virtual deep space healthcare operations and methodologies. It could be transformative as well for our national healthcare systems for chronic care patients and patients who live in remote uh, regions of the world. So lessons learned from space or from ground can be potentially spun off or spun on to lower costs and better health outcomes in space and in our nations. So the theme of the ICRP symposium is Mars, and the theme about the future of technology and exploration in which you and your colleagues will push the boundaries of your field and your imaginations to envision where this very diverse sector, the role that it can play in the next 20 to 30 years of the, fu of the future. It sounds daunting, it sounds ambitious, it sounds aggressive, but uh, I am a child of the 60s and the 70s. I grew up in an era when education, when culture, when civil rights, when universal health care, and when space exploration were being pushed. We had an inspirational leader who said that uh, we do things in space, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because they will motivate us to, to exhibit the best of our energies and skills. I wish you the same kind of motivation and enthusiasm and passion as our former leader ex explained to me when I, was, when I was young. Good luck and thank you. Okay, so we have time for a couple of questions. Um, all right, where do we start? Um, so one of the questions was, is it really necessary to send um, people into space and what are the benefits compared to the risks? 
and the advantages against sending robots? Well, in the case of Canada, um, there's a number of reasons why we do it. For, it's a no-brainer. We make money doing it. The Canadian, industry, the Canadian taxpayer typically supports our program to the tune of $350 million a year. But the Canadian space industry, not the aerospace industry, the space industry typically has revenues of 4 or $5 billion to the global market. 40% of our space industry sales are, are exported. So it's a no-brainer right away. The first part, the answer is we make money doing it. But also there's technological and scientific benefits as well. Uh, we built the, um, the Canada Arm and the Space Shuttle, which has now been converted into a two-meter-long neurosurgical robot arm, which has performed a number of surgical operations to remove tumors uh, from the brain, correct arterial venous malformations, and also to uh, remove blockages associated with with hydrocephalus. But there's many other spin-offs from space technology that has benefited terrestrial society. But I think, Gillian, that probably the number one reason that we should send humans rather than the robots is that the intangible reasons. It inspires the population. When I was young, uh, I studied, the, read, read the biographies of early Canadian explorers. Uh, the names don't mean anything to you, but David Thompson, Simon, Simon Fraser, Lever Andre, Sir Alexander Mackenzie. And these people inspired me because they were going outside of their comfort zone. They were exploring uh, frontiers that uh, where robots couldn't go. And they exhibited the kind of personality traits that I saw in myself. So self-care, vision, attention to detail, teamwork, followership, multicultural uh, sensitivity. So uh, these kinds of explorers were role models for me. And they played a role in the direction that my educational and my career path went. Curiosity. Uh, and the Hubble Space Telescope have opened up our eyes to the scientific wonders of, of space, but space exploration is more than science. It's also got a social and a human purpose as well. Thank you. Okay, another question here. Are there useful parallels to a Mars mission in current expeditions to Antarctica and the long-term submarine patrols, as well as the International Space Station? What was the first part? Uh, are there useful parallels? Absolutely. Um, doing deep space missions, doing any type of space mission is a very expensive uh, endeavor. Uh, but there are a number of parallels, not perfect parallels. There's no such thing as a perfect uh, analogous parallel to space flight on Earth. But especially for the uh, uh, psychosocial aspects uh, and the um, operational aspects, of deep sp uh, space missions, yes. Antarctic uh, research stations, Arctic research stations, uh, long duration missions aboard ships and aboard nuclear uh, submarines can help us to better understand intercrew coordination and some of the operational challenges. All right, before I open it up to the floor, I've, there's another question that's come up a couple of times on the app. Um, what kind of nuclear reactor will be deployed on Mars' surface? An actual reactor or a radioisotope generator? Yes, it will be an RTG. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay, does anybody have any questions um, that they'd like to ask from the, from the floor? West Bolt, University of Florida. Thank you so much for this informative uh, and fascinating presentation. Uh, another nuclear reactor <laughs> question. Is, is, uh, the, uh, is the program no longer considering nuclear propulsion for the Mars transfer vehicle? It sounds like from your slides that it'll be chemical propulsion to get there and get back. Uh, not at all. The okay. Mars transfer vehicle is still considering ion thrust, which will be okay. uh, nuclear as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chandra Demeter from uh, Winnipeg. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming and talking. An excellent talk. Um, uh, kind of a f tangential question: Are there any relativistic time-space issues for the astronauts relative to their what age they leave, what age they come back? <laughs> wow, I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> but many years ago, uh, I visited a, a high school. It might have been in Winnipeg. And um, some bright kid came up there, he'd just been studying relativistic physics, and he said, I, I crunched the numbers, I know how long you were in space, I know what speeds you were, were traveling at in space, it doesn't approach the speed of light, but he said, you are one quarter of a second younger than if you had never flown. So, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, there's one question here that on, on the app that uh, I'll ask, but I think it might be uh, more appropriate for during the next session, and that's what's the estimated effective dose for a return trip from Mars? It's probably a more appropriate <laughs> question for the next session. Um, I'm looking at Lena Tomey. I think that the, the Mars uh, mission, we're expecting between three and five, um, uh, what's the unit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, next session. Next session. <laughs> I'm an astronaut. Okay, what else have we got here? Uh, All right, I'll open it up to the floor again. Do we have any more questions? Actually, okay. All right. Thank I you. think we'll um, leave it there. Thank you very much, um, Bob, for your vision of what Mars travel will be.